So what we're going to do now, the last five lectures of the course are going to be, I mean, for me, the most interesting part of the course. And this is the Girdle incompleteness theorems. So I only have time this term just to do the first incompleteness theorem, which is there in chapter six of the, the lecture notes. <laughs> Now, it's a little bit confusing because the word completeness gets so many uses uh, in logic. And it's, uh, I put here just two, well, we'll have three, three principal uses of the word completeness. So just try to clarify a little bit. So we say a set of sentences gamma, right? A theory is a set of sentences. We say that's complete if for any other sentence or formula, either from gamma, you can prove sigma or its negation. So that's one use of the word completeness. And then there's the Gödel completeness theorem, which he did in his PhD thesis. So the principal direction here was from left to right, was if in every structure in which a set of axioms gamma was true, you'd always have sigma being true, then actually you could prove it. You could prove in predicate calculus, PC, that sigma was derivable using the rules of proof from gamma. So we have the completeness of a theory, so it's an adjective describing a theory, and we have this theorem. And now we're going to have the incompleteness theorem. <laughs> So the girdle and it's called the sorry incompleteness theorem. So I may abbreviate this as G one I T. Sometimes people do this. So the girdle first incompleteness theorem. So what Gödel discovered <clears throat> then in the mid thirties, uh, 1932, I think it was, <clears throat> was that actually, despite what David Hilbert and others were trying to do, he could show that any reasonable axiom system for arithmetic was not complete in the first sense the adjective and meaning one that was there. So, for example, so the axiom system Q for number theory now if you look back in the notes, I think it's example 225, <coughs> is this is just a finite set of axioms, I think the seven axioms for arithmetic. Like we have three axioms for group theory, we've got a system of arithmetic with just seven axioms. There are many axiomatizations of set theory, but this was a particularly simple one. There'd be some sigma such that Q could not prove sigma, and also it couldn't prove its negation. Okay. Here. So Q was an incomplete set of axioms about arithmetic. Okay. Now, actually, this by itself, I mean, this is not what Gödel actually said. This is a kind of a modern take on this. <clears throat> uh, it's actually rather easy to show that Q is incomplete. It's actually there in the notes, but we'll, we'll, om we'll omit that subsection. Right? What Gödel did was something much stronger. <clears throat> right? What he said was that not just for Q, but actually any reasonable system of arithmetic whose axioms extended Q, 
right, was going to be incomplete. There's no way that we could expand Q to a set of axioms and find that it was complete. Now, at the time, Piano arithmetic Again, which you'll see as an example in the notes. <clears throat> this is an infinite set of axioms, much stronger system than Q. It's got an induction scheme. You can prove all sorts of things in Piano arithmetic. And we could say that a lot of current mo uh, modern number theory, number theorists to use effectively things that are in provable in Piano arithmetic. So actually what he did was something stronger. any reasonable <coughs> axiom system T extending Q will be incomplete. So of course here what <laughs> is crucial here is to what you mean by reasonable here. Because if you just look at, if I let gamma just be the theory of the natural number structure here, this includes everything that's true in the natural number structure, and it leaves out everything that's false. So this is a complete theory. The axioms of Q are true in N, so gamma contains Q here. But this is not what is meant, right? Reasonable is a much more restrictive idea. We can't just throw in anything. What we want is some effectively decidable, some algorithm, this is what Hilbert was after, was some algorithm where we could just tell, we could present to the algorithm a number theoretic sentence and it would say yes or no, zero or one, whether this was provable from the axioms or not. So what Gödel did was scupper this Hilbert program. Right? He said there was no reasonable axiom system which is gonna work like this. Now, at the time, again, he didn't use Q. He said axiom systems extending Russell and Whitehead's Principia Mathematica. But he didn't exactly quite know what reasonable was either. Right? It was some algorithmically given axiom system, something you could write a prescription down for to tell whether something was in the axiom set or not. <clears throat> and it was left until Turing came along with the idea of a Turing machine and computability, that Gödel realized that what Turing had done was give a very nice way of describing something as reasonable. So what reasonable came to mean was computable. And we'll use again, <laughs> As kind of synonym for this was what on the in Princeton, Church, Cleany, and Girdle by this time, who was there, they were using the idea of something being, they just called it effectively decidable. Now this again is <laughs> I mean, one can make this a little bit more precise, right? But just as it stands here, this just means algorithmic, right? In some way.
So this here is Turing's idea. This idea of computable. And people then realized that everything that was effectively decidable or algorithmic <clears throat> could be done on one of Turing's computers, one of his thought computers here. So computable and effectively decidable came to be seen as the same thing here. Of course, you might argue, you have to say what exactly a computer is and, and you know, talk about space and time limitations and so on. So there's a discussion to be had here. Right? But basically, if we keep in mind the idea of something being algorithmic or effectively decidable or being for what we have a computer program for, this is fine. So what reasonable came to mean came to mean computable. So a reasonable axiom system would be one for which we've got a computer program for, right? And we could plug into the computer a code for a sentence and the program would just say yes or no as to whether it's one of your axioms. So we've got a, a computational procedure for just deciding whether something is an axiom or not. So that's what reasonable is here for us. We'll give a more mathematical equivalent at some point uh, later on. Okay, so um, I talked about, <clears throat> you know, how are we going to get formulae into a computer, right? Well, we're gonna to have to code them up using numbers. And if you, look at page 90 here, this is where uh, we do that coding. So this work here actually, so this predated uh, Turing by a couple of years. The idea was that we could code up language, math our nice mathematical language for number theory, so in particular, the language Q is the one where we've got zero, a successor function, zero constant, and plus and times um, relations, our functions, and the domain is the natural numbers. So the language for that, we'll call that L. So here, definition 6.1 is just one way here of coding up the language by numbers. Now, it really doesn't matter at all what, um, what language we, we use here. <clears throat> so you can see here, we've got the components of the language. There are brackets, implication, symbol, negation, universal quantifier. Here's the arithmetical stuff over here, zero successor plus and times. And to be, for our convenience, we'll just call v0, v1, v2, x, y, and z. So I'm not all the time writing out v0, v1, v2. Or x, y, and z can just stand for some other, other variables. So we're just gonna code strings up by decimal number strings. It's very simple. and It doesn't really matter how we do it. So for example, this here, it is you just read off from the string of symbols what the code has to be, right? And you can see leftmost bracket starts with a one down here, then there's a four for the negation and so on down through here. And we get infinitely many variables because we can have a five followed by, well, one, well, a number of nines equal to whether Vk, for example, will be five followed by k nines. So the idea is simply that there is an algorithmic process. Given a string, it's got a number code. Given a number code, we can check whether it's a 
code for a legitimate string. So this one here looks like it might be a code of a legitimate string, but in fact it's not, right? Because there's something missing here. There should be another item to go there, right? To make this a legitimate code. Right? But you get the point. The idea is that we can just code stuff up and we can run a program to check whether it's a nicely formed formula or sentence or not. Right? So terms in the language, these are function symbols applied to constants or other terms. Right? So we can check whether a string is a code for a term or not. So we say that being a term of the language is effectively decidable. It's algorithmic in the sense that I was indicating on the board. Okay. And once you start thinking like that, then you realize actually almost everything that we've done about syntax manipulation is algorithmic. So it's not just being a term here is effectively decidable. We can look at a code string here, a uh, code of a string, and check whether it's a, a code of a formula and whether that formula has got any free variables or not. So we can determine whether it's a sentence or not. And the sub function, that's a syntactic maneuver, which is just about substituting something for something else inside a formula. So that, again, you would have no trouble writing a, a program for, for a function that would affect that, acting on numbers which code up the relevant formulae in terms that are being substituted. OK, uh, are there any questions about that? Because I'm going to kind of continue in this vein for a little bit. So it's good to get this straight. OK. Now, if we do that, <clears throat> OK, so if you grant, if you grant that, then the idea is that we can also check whether something is going to be a proof or not. What would this entail? Switch to paper. So coding of proofs. I could take my set of seven axioms, right? And maybe I write a proof from that. So what is one of these formal proofs? It's just a finite string of formulae, which ends in sigma. Right? Everything that occurs here, it's either an axiom from Q, or it's derived from two earlier things on the list by modus ponens. This was rule one, modus ponens. Or perhaps it's derived from an earlier thing on the list by using rule two generalization. So just two simple rules and seven axioms to work from. Now, I could think here what I've got is, you know, phi, phi 1, phi 2, phi k, and here's phi n. So phi n better be sigma if this is what I'm thinking of this as a proof of. I can look at the girdle numbers 
gn for girdle number of each of these phi k's. So I could look at a list of all of these girdle numbers. Right, these decimal digits, these decimal numbers. And I could just put these together. I could, let's suppose these are the numbers, I don't know, N1, NK, up to, uh, I wish I've used N here. Let's call this M, NM. I could take this string of numbers coding this purported proof here, and I could code the whole lot up as one number. So I could use primes to do this. So I could just let this be x, 2 to the n1, 3 to the n2, 5 to the n3, and so on, up to the nth prime here to nm. So now I've just got one gigantic number, which might code up a proof like this. Okay, well, there is now no difficulty in imagining. Right? Computer programmers will take a number, it'll look at its prime factors, right? it'll look at the powers of those prime factors, right? And then check, it's, it's a list of some of the first k primes to these different powers. It can then decode the numbers here and check whether this is a correct proof or not. After all, it's very algorithmic. To check whether this is a correctly applied rule, it only has to look back through these finitely many numbers and just check that this is a consequence of two of these previous things. And so I can give a yes, no answer to every line on the proof as to whether it's correctly derived. Right? There are only three ways for something to get on here. It has to come from Q as an axiom or come from earlier things by a rule. So the idea then is just simply this. So if I think of this as a code of a proof, So this is again effectively decidable. So there's a function, right? Implicit in this discussion is there is a function. Let's just call it f of proof here. And what that is going to do is just return one or zero if x codes a proof in Q. Otherwise, if not. So I just want to convince you that there is an algorithmic process here for doing this. What you'll see on page 92 is further discussion on this. I mean, there are various things that need to go into this, right? We need a function that's going to give us code numbers of formulae. formula of Q, formula of the language. Okay. We're going to have to have a function that tells us whether something is an axiom. Well, that's easy for Q, there are only seven of them. We're going to have to have a function that's the characteristic function of codes of sentences. 
So all of this is kind of parts of this discussion here. Right? But I think the idea is, and I think it's convincing enough for us, that the idea that, that we can write programs to do this coding, and we can write programs that will code up proofs. And then we have other programs that will undo that. It will take a number and tell us whether it's a code of a proof or not. Any questions there? I mean, there's one thing to note here. There's one thing to note here that's important is that we're not suggesting that there's a computer program that you feed in a sentence and it'll output zero or one as to whether that sentence is provable from the axioms queue. Okay. We're, we're not saying that. What we're saying is that given a proof, a program can check it. That's different from actually saying there's a program that will provide a proof. What we can do is check proofs. We don't have an algorithmic process that will provide us with a proof of either sigma or not sigma. Right? That's an important difference. Right? OK. Now, again, I've used this kind of words, you know, effectively decidable, like up here on the board, right? and algorithmic. And, you know, I'd encourage you to think of that as being the same as computable, right? as given by a Turing machine or any other kind of you know, theoretical computer without bounds of space and time on it. Right? So these are, the idea of being effectively decidable, of course, is, is somewhat vague, right? something which you've got an algorithm for. There isn't a mathematical definition for that. So what uh, Gödel and Erbron and uh, Kleene in Princeton were doing was they tried to give a mathematical definition of a set of functions that they thought would include all the algorithmic functions. And these are called the recursive functions. We'll look at these at a moment. But th their ideas didn't really convince Gödel that everything that was effectively decidable could be captured by the idea of a recursive function. It was only when Turing produced his machines and showed that these recursive functions were things that could be computed on the machines. And Turing proposed that being machine computable be the gold standard, as it were, of what's effectively decidable. The Gödel realized how he could state the incompleteness theorem using ideas of computability. So, Let's look at the notes then. Uh, let's share, go back to sharing the screen again, if I can find it. Here we go. Now, I don't want your hearts to sink. I thought, oh, here is another definition that I've got to internalize and understand. You don't have to at all, but uh, I just want to look at it just to show you the shape of it so that you get the idea. You don't have to memorize or be familiar with these clauses at all. In fact, I mean, I shall use the word recursive function, but these will be the same as algorithmic functions or effectively decidable functions. The point is that this here, definition 6.5, is a mathematical definition. So it's completely precise. So the idea is to base, uh, to build up functions 
kind of inductively from some basis functions. So there are three kinds of basis function. The successor function, which assigns to any natural number its successor. There's the zero function that returns any natural number to zero. And then there's a projection function here, uij. I think that j is supposed to be a subscript to the u, not to the i. And the idea is that from a, a string of i numbers, it picks out the jth number. So we declare anything under these three to be recursive functions. And then we just build up. Let's just switch to this line. If I know that g and f1 to fk are recursive functions, and g is k array, then this is a recursive function, the composition. Again, think computability. If I can compute f1 up to fk, and I can compute g, I can certainly compute g of f1 up to fk. I put the programs together. The important clause here is recursion. So if you did the set theory course and saw the recursion theorem for natural numbers, that this kind of thing is familiar. We say f of zero, and then some fixed parameters that we're going to carry along as some base case, some p. And then we define f of x plus one in that data is to be g of f of, well, the previous number that we defined in all of the data. So this is a, a way of building up a function by recursion. And the recursion theorem tells you there is such a function f. And then finally, there is some other, a slightly fancier, well, not, not fancier, but one other clause here. If I've got a recursive function g, then f is declared to be a recursive function. It looks for the least z where g of z is zero, if there is such. If there isn't such a z, then it's just undefined. So this is called the minimalization operator. And it indicates to us that recursive functions needn't be total functions. They can be undefined on some inputs. And this tallies actually with computer programming. Right? The computer may not halt on some inputs, but it may halt on others. So a recursive function is something that's built up using the basis functions and these operations. Now it turns out that every function in everyday computation of the use is recursive. And conversely, any recursive function is computable. There's a program that will calculate it. And if you were a programmer wanting to write down a program, well, you would look at the recursive function and you would see how it was built up. It's a little tree of its construction here from basis functions and using these operations. So you'd look at the tree of how it's constructed and you'd write a program accordingly. So again, we're not going to go into these, these details here. But now when my discussion about effectively decidable functions, you know, the ones that will be the characteristic functions of formula or axioms or proofs here, I can now say, well, these are actually mathematically defined functions. These are recursive functions. And indeed, in general, we'll say that a set of numbers is decidable. You'll also see effectively decidable in the literature or recursive. If we're emphasizing here the mathematical definition just means its characteristic function is recursive. It means there's a recursive function f, which gives me a zero or one, depending on whether the number is not or it is in x. So we're just going to now declare right, that all of the kind of testing 
for formulae terms and proofs and so on can be done using recursive functions. Right? The set of Girdle code numbers of terms is a recursive set in this idea. So this proposition 6, 8 then actually tells us, I mean, well, it just, it's a, for us, it's just a listing of some of the things that I've been talking about. So if we look at 8, 6.8a here, it's saying the set of girdle numbers of the following sets of recursive formulae, terms, axioms of predicate calculus and Q, and then codes of proofs using the axioms of predicate calculus and Q. Right? And as I suggested, coded using prime powers as above. So it's not, it's not, as I said, it's not too important whether you have in mind the notion of recursive function as a basic concept, and hence recursive sets of numbers, or rather this more informal idea of computable or programmable. Yeah. So, There's an extension here, part B of this proposition, <clears throat> which brings us in line with the final statement of the incompleteness theorem, which is about ways to extend the axiom system Q. This is what our notion of reasonableness is going to be. It's recursiveness. If I've got a set of axioms T that extend Q, then if I've got a program that'll tell me whether something is an axiom in Q, sorry, in T, then I can rerun these ideas. So let's go to paper here. And we expand these ideas by considering axiom systems T extending Q. Where T is a decidable set. Recursive set of axioms. So it means I've got some function f sub t, and this is going to return me a one or a zero if x is the girdle number of some axiom that's in t. So now when I think of proofs, instead of being a proof in, in q, Now I can have something that could be an axiom from T. Or again, I've got my two rules. But if I convinced you that uh, there were functions that would be characteristic functions of proofs from Q, I think you should believe that there are also going to be functions that are going to give us the characteristic functions of proofs from T. The variant is now is, you know, I give you a number X, you decode it using prime power decoding. 
right? And that'll check whether it is a nice list of formulae here. And now we check, so this is the first check. Second check is we check that this sequence is a code of a proof. So I say it's a sequence code of a proof. Using now axioms from T. Well, predicate calculus, which is there behind all of our first order systems and T. So whereas before we were just looking to see whether something was an ax, one of the seven axioms of Q, now we're going to do this looking at possibly infinite sets of axioms that extend Q here. So the idea then is the same. There's some recursive function And I'll let's say, let's say a proof in T. Right. And this will be a one or zero. If <coughs> X is a code of a proof, proper proof in T, right, of some sigma. Meaning the last formula on the list. Right? So again, again, if you give me a proof, well, if you give me a number and say it is a proof, you claim it's a proof of some sigma, what does check one say? Someone, someone asked? Check one that says you look at X and you check when you decode X that it is indeed, it uses the first M prime numbers and it checks whether the prime powers, the prime factors there themselves code correct formula in our language. Check two is then whether that sequence of formulae constitutes a proof. Okay. So the result is if you give me a number X and say it's a proof of sigma in T, then I can check it. All right, so then I can check then whether T proves sigma. But this is not, it's not saying there is a recursive function, G say, so that G of X is one or zero if T proves sigma, where the girdle number of sigma is X. So these are different. So do understand the difference between this, right? This function, if it were to exist, as a recursive function. Yeah. This would give us yes or no answers to whether any particular formula here was provable in T. Right? What we can do is check proofs. 
It doesn't mean we can provide proofs. Right? And this again is something that um, occurs in, uh, this is something that occurs in computer science, right? right? There are no perfect proof checkers, right? Program checkers in computer science, right? So one can, I mean, this is what uh, people want when they're writing languages or writing compilers uh, for computers. They'd like to have program checkers, right? But in fact, there's no perfect program checker right, that can check all programs. And that goes back, that's one aspect of the Gödel incompleteness theorem. Yeah. So there isn't a program that will uh, produce proofs, yes or no answers to proofs. We can set a machine running and it can start producing proofs. It just has to start checking all of the numbers and see which ones code proofs and which don't. And it can start outputting proofs. But that doesn't mean that's a different process from saying, here's this formula sigma, I want a yes, no answer as to whether it's provable in T. This the machine cannot do. And this is what we'll see the first incompleteness theorem says. Okay, fine. Uh, if there are any questions, please send them through. Otherwise, we continue tomorrow. So someone asks whether from today's lecture, do we not have to learn the definitions then? Do we just take away the idea that proofs can be coded? Uh, in principle, yes, right? You don't have to learn the definition of recursive functions, right? You don't have to learn what that coding system is with all of those digits, right? It doesn't really matter what the coding system is, but it, it's just that the fact it is so doable, right? But you need to know what I mean kind of when I say something is recursive. You need to know that the idea that being a term, a formula, a sentence, or coding of a proof is something that is algorithmic and can be given by a recursive function. So I will use recursive functions in the future. I'll refer to them and I'll use them as characteristic functions of sets and so on. But you don't have to know, you don't have to internalize what the definition of a recursive function is. And you're not going to be asked on the exam whether, you know, how to construct particular recursive functions from other recursive functions.